And uh, if you have any uh, gently used or new coats you want to donate, mainly for kids ages, um, from infants on up to you know kids, uh, we would definitely uh, be a blessed to have them. We're going to put a tote in the back of the church and you can just drop them in there. We'll do that up through December and we'll deliver those to the Life Center. So we're excited about that. And then be praying for a revival meeting we have here coming up in November, November 28th through uh, December the 1st. We have Dr. Barry Webb coming to be with us. He's a wonderful preacher, him and his wife sing, and he's also a chalk artist. If you've never been involved in a service where somebody does chalk art, you're, you're missing a good blessing. And you'll be able to, to see it here November 28th through December the 1st. So be praying about that and be inviting some folks out to come uh, for our revival meeting. So we're excited about all those things. Also, too, uh, I want you to be in prayer for, for myself, not being selfish this morning, but I shared with our Sunday school class, uh, as your pastor, I've been here a little over a year, I've uh, been preaching for about five years, off and on different places, filling pulpits, but as a pastor, I've had many firsts, many experiences will be a, a first experience for me, and uh, the Lord is blessing every one of those, and I'm thankful for that, but this coming Wednesday is going to be another first for me, I have to do a funeral service uh, for a young man who took his own life. And uh, I found it to be one of the hardest things that I've had to do so far to minister to that family. But uh, I'm looking at it as an opportunity to be able to share God's word and be a comfort to that family. So that's going to be Wednesday um, at 3 o'clock here at the church. So I ask that uh, you would please be in prayer for the family and be in prayer for me as we try to minister to that family. But uh, tough, tough time for them especially. So just remember them in prayer, the, the Miller family. This morning... Uh, I'm going to preach to you a message, or I'm going to try to preach to a message, what I've entitled, Are You a Contender or Are You a Pretender? And uh, one of my good friends, this is an ongoing joke with us about some different things, but uh, I'm a pretty competitive person, whether it's sports or whether it's even uh, showing livestock. My kids are involved in that, and uh, we're competitive. We like to, to do well, and we like to give God glory. And whatever we do, I tell my kids, do it to your best ability. I don't care what you're doing. God wants us to do it to the best of our abilities. And my friend and I have this ongoing joke about things, and many times in life, sometimes it comes down to uh, to cost of things, to whether you're a contender or whether you're a pretender, and how much money you want to spend on something. But I got to thinking about that joke that we share back and forth with each other, and you know, to be a contender for God, it don't cost us a penny. It don't cost us one cent to be a contender for God. And more of what I want to be than anything is to help make a difference in this world for God, right. with Him. Uh, we can do it. Without him, we're nothing. We have to do it with him. But today I want to read to you some scriptures from James chapter number 1. They're familiar scriptures that we've all heard. But James chapter number 1, uh, verse number 19 through 27 is where I'll be at this morning. It says in verse number 19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself... And goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But who also looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful bearer, or forgetful hearer, excuse me, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do today just give you thanks and praise for allowing us to be in your house, for this beautiful sunshine that you've given us today. We thank you, Lord, for the rain that you sent. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of our blessings. In our eyes, many times we think that they're small and, and unworthy to be lifted up, but we give you praise for all things. We give you praise for the breath of life, for the health that we have, for our ability to go out, Lord, and to make a living and to support our families. We give you thanks and praise for all those things. Today, Lord, as we've
come here to your house. I pray that all of us have come to receive a blessing. And I know, Father, Lord, if we've come willing to receive, Lord, that you will provide that blessing. So today, as we go forward through this service, as always, I pray, Lord, that you take the focus off me. You take it and put it on yourself, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and your word. And I pray today that Christians' hearts here would be challenged, that we could literally take these words and apply them to our life, Lord, that not just be hearers of the word, but, Lord, to be doers of your word. And I pray, Lord, today that your spirit would move and convict hearts here if there's someone here that has never asked Christ into their heart to be their Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Lord, today would be that day. Right. Today would be the day that they ask you for salvation, and, Lord, they would receive it, Lord, and begin a new life serving you. Father, I pray, too, for those that have gathered in the parking lot. I pray that you would bless them. I pray for those, Lord, that wanted to be here today, but for whatever reason it is that they couldn't, I pray, Lord, you would also send a blessing their way. I pray, Lord, for the ones that will listen to this message on YouTube, that, Lord, that your word would go forth there, and that people could be saved there as well. And again, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we give him all the honor and all the glory. We'll ask it in his name today. Amen. Amen. Today, by the way of introduction, I want to ask you a question. Whether we're a contender or a pretender, I want to ask you this. What have you done for God? What have you done for God? You say, well, he's done a lot for me, and he does. I mentioned many of those things in my opening prayer, that he's given us the breath of life that we have today. He's given us our health. He's given us our ability to, to go forth. And yet, so many times we take all those things for granted. But yet, we can do things for him. He doesn't need us to do his work, but he wants to use us to do his work. He wants to use us. He created us so that we could have fellowship with him, that he would love us, and that, that we could be an avenue and a tool to help spread his word. And then I would ask you, what have you done for the church? I'm not saying what have you done for our church. What have you done for your church? Because I can tell you it's not your church. It's not my church. It's his church. Right. You know, many times I'll hear somebody say, well, I'm going to go down to Josh Parlett's church. I don't have a church. You are the church. We have a building that we gather in that, we, that, uh, we, that I try to minister to, but it's not my church. It's the Lord's church. My former pastor who's in heaven today was uh, at his church for almost 40 years, and that's what everybody would say. I'm going to Frank Painter's, and he would get aggravated. He would say, it ain't my church. I don't know why people say they're coming. I said, well, you're, you've been there so long. They, just, that's just, they associate you with that church, and that's fine. But when it comes down to it, it's not our church. Somebody's asked, well, here recently we've opened our church up and we've had some memorial services, some funeral services for folks that don't attend church here. You say, should we do that? I can tell you we shouldn't even ask the question, should we do it? We should be a blessing to those in our community. And as I said, we can look at it as an opportunity to help spread the gospel, help spread the message. But today as I read these verses in James, I'll ask you those two questions and I want you to ponder on those as we go through some things. What have you done for God? And what have you done for his church? What have you done for the church? The Bible tells us that Christ loved the church and what he gave himself for the church. Amen. He loved the church enough, he loved you and I enough that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in our place. To be our uh, payment for sin that we couldn't pay. It's a debt that we couldn't pay. He provided his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to do that. He loved his church enough that he sent his son to die for it. Today we can be serious about many things in life. And we can be serious about our walk of faith. And today if you're here and you're a Christian, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, I would pray that you're serious about your walk of faith with the Lord. It is a daily walk. And we need Him each and every step of the way. Without Him, as I said earlier, we're nothing. Our Bible that we have before us today is filled with stories of average ordinary people who God used to be a contender for him. Amen. God chose his disciples, average ordinary people, to be a contender that he could use them to help spread the gospel, that he could use them to help his work. He used the Apostle Paul to, to be one of the greatest missionaries of all time to help start churches and plant churches. He used average ordinary people, and he can certainly use us today. So I pray that all of you could leave this place today and say that I am a contender for Christ. Or that I certainly want to be a contender for Christ. I want to look at these scriptures that I've read this morning and go through a few things where it can show us how that we can be 
a contender for the Lord. In verse number 19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Let's break these scriptures down a little bit here in verse number 19. When James is saying, uh, let every man be swift to hear. Now, we use these verses, and, and I, I, I love these verses. I'm guilty of not following these verses many times because many too many times I don't want to listen. I want to open my big mouth up, and my foot goes right straight in my mouth, and before you know it, I've said something that I shouldn't say. In a way, we could apply those scriptures and, and use this for that, and we should. We should always be slow to speak and eager to listen to somebody. If you ask somebody how they're doing, please take the time to sit there and listen to it. Because I can tell you that's an open-ended question sometimes. Sometimes you might get all I'm doing just fine. And sometimes 20 minutes later you might still be standing there listening to their problems. But remember always that you ask them how they were doing. Be respectful and listen to them. But anyway, I believe what James is saying here is this. Be swift to hear. In order for us, as we go down and look at the rest of these verses where he's saying he wants people to be a doer of the word and not just to hear. He's saying for us here, be swift to hear. And I ask you to hear what? Hear the word of God. That's what he's saying. Be swift to hear. Be swift to hear. Be prepared. Be alert. Be ready to hear the word of God. Now, I can tell you, if you come to church on Sunday mornings, I would encourage all of us to bring our Bibles. A young man come in the door this morning carrying his Bible, and I'm so proud to see that. All of us, we come. Uh, if you're here and you play sports, you go to football, you, you take your equipment with you. You take your helmet, your cleats. You go to basketball. You better be wearing your tennis shoes. We come to church, I tell you, uh, we need to bring our Bible. We need to bring God's Word. Yes, we put it up on the screen so you, that you can read it. But it's nothing like having it in your hands and, and read it yourself. We should be swift to hear the Word of God. Where I'm going with this is I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to bring your Bible. And I encourage you to be faithful to the house of God. And listen to the preaching. Listen to the, to the singing. Let, come to the Bible studies. Be faithful to the house of God. But I can tell you, if you come on Sunday mornings and you hear me and that's all you get, that's not enough. That's not enough for you. That's not enough spiritual food to get you through the week. Now, I like to eat. I like to use comparisons about food and eating. And I can tell you, I don't just visit the refrigerator one time per week. I probably could get by for several weeks by doing that. I've got enough build up here to last, to last me. But we can't get by with just visiting the refrigerator once per week. We've got to visit it multiple times per day. And I tell you, that should be what we're saying here. James is saying, be swift to hear. You can't just hear. You've got to hear your own self. You've got to read God's Word. We've got to get into God's Word, and we've got to read God's Word. We've got to study it. We've got to apply it to our hearts and to our lives. The Word of God tells us that we might hide it in our hearts, that we might not sin against Him. James is telling us here, if we're going to be a contender for the Lord, we need to be swift to hear. We need to be listening to the Word of God. We need to be obedient to the Word of God. When He speaks to our hearts, we need to be listening to that. When he speaks to our hearts to, that we should stop and pray, that we should read a certain passage of scripture or share something with somebody, we should be obedient to do that. We should be swift to hear. We should be ready and willing and able to do that. We should make it a priority. And I tell you, even as your pastor, sometimes it's hard for me to make it a priority. I'm not really a, a morning person. I get up and do what I need to do to go to work, but uh, that's not my time of day to, to read God's word because I can't focus on it. You know, later on in the, in the day, in the, if I catch a time around lunchtime or in the afternoon, there's where I'll try to go and do a daily devotion. That's not counting preparing and studying for, for messages here at the church. That's just a daily devotion that I want to do to share God's Word. And I need to read it each and every day of my life. Do I do it? I'm guilty of telling you I don't. There's, there's days where I'll hit the pillow and say, Lord, I, forgive me. I have forgotten today to, to open your Word. And that, that's, I'm embarrassed to even admit it today as your pastor, but we have to make it. A priority in our life. We have to be swift to hear the word of God. He goes on in this verse, and then he says, slow to speak. I believe what James is telling us here is he's telling us we need to listen to the word of God, but then he's telling us we need to be slow to speak. Each and every week, I pray that we are a witness for the Lord, and we are called to be a witness for God. When we're saved, and we accept Christ as our Savior, we are saved for service. We're saved for his service. And I encourage you to be a witness for the Lord. But many times, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it multiple times if you keep coming back to listen to me, our best witness is not the words that come from our mouth, but our actions. It's what James is saying later down here in these words. Don't just hear the words and don't just say the words. Be a doer of the word. That's what he's saying. Our best witness can be our actions. And many times when we try to witness to somebody, it turns into an argument. It turns into an argument about 
theology. It turns into an argument about, well, you're a Baptist and I'm a brethren or I'm a Pentecostal and I'm this. Well, I tell you, when it comes down to it, again, when we get to heaven, there's going to be no designation beside of our name that Mike Duncan was a, a forward for Christ Baptist Church. The Lord don't care. All he cares about is his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life that he's saved, and that's how he's going to get there. He's not going to determine whether we're a Baptist, Amen. whether we're a Pentecostal, or what we are. We're going to be there, and whether we got along on this side of, of heaven or not, I can tell you when we get up to there, we're going to get along. If not, I don't believe we're going to be there. Amen? Right. But listen to this. He tells us that, that that's how we need to be slow to speak. Be slow to speak sometimes. Now, if God gives you an opportunity to be a verbal witness to somebody, share God's word to them. Give them John 3, 16 that Ralph's been giving us every week. Give them, give them your memory verse, your life verse. I don't know if you have a life verse, but I, if you don't, I would, I would encourage you to get into God's word and claim one. Claim one that's special to you and cling to that. Cling to that life verse. If you go through adversity or trials or trouble, go back to your life verse. Go back to that verse that means so much to you and be an encouragement. Share that to somebody. But also be slow sometimes that if we know somebody's going to be confrontational, if we know it's going to be hard to witness to that person. Do it not in your words, but do it in your actions. And I believe that's what James is saying here. Be a doer of your word. And then he goes on and says, be slow to anger. And that one hits home to me because, believe it or not, your pastor has a little bit of a temper. I'm not, I'm not going to admit my fault to you this morning. I've gotten better with it, but I have a temper. And sometimes it seems like this lady set up here on the front row, really these two ladies, do a really good job at testing my temper. I don't know what it is about it, but it is. And all of you may be today can relate to that, but it's the same what I just said here, what James is saying that when we're talking to somebody about God, it don't need to turn into an argument. It don't need to turn into a debate. Now, I can tell you that I am an independent, fundamental Baptist. If somebody asks me, what is your de denomination? I don't have one. I'm an independent, fundamental Baptist. I believe in the fundamentals of God's Word. Amen. I believe in the doctrines of God's Word. I don't believe in, uh, in the doctrines of, of certain denominational churches. I believe that if it's found in God's Word, that's how we should act. That's what we should do. And that's how our church should conduct itself the same way. And that's what I am. But many times I could try to witness to somebody and they say, well, oh, you believe in eternal security. I, I do that. I do. I believe that you're saved if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says we're sealed until the day of redemption. It says that no man, no power, no principality, nothing can remove us from God's hand. And I believe if we're truly saved, then we are. That's not a license for us to go to sin. But I'm not going to sit and argue with a brethren over that. I'm not going to do that because that's not being an effective witness for the Lord. What we need to be is swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's what uh, the Bible is telling us. In preparing for this message, I, I read an interesting story, and it, it may not be interesting to you all, but I'll share it anyway. Uh, there was an old preacher named Jonathan Edwards, way, 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 way back. And uh, he was an English pastor, and actually he was the third president of Princeton University. It goes to show us where our colleges and our universities and our Ivy League institutions have gone from, from being uh, places uh, that uh, were founded on the principles of God and on God's Word to some of the most liberal places that you'll ever find today. But this man was one of America's greatest preachers and one of America's greatest thinkers. And he had a, a daughter, just like I have two daughters and a son. But he had this daughter, and his daughter had a, a little bit of an issue. She had a really bad temper. I could relate to that. Some of my kids sometimes have really bad tempers. But anyway, this man fell in love with Jonathan Edwards' daughter. And keep in mind that, uh, you know, I, I love my kids. Just as God said that he would lay down his life for the church, I believe that as a father that we should be willing to lay down our life for our family if it, if it comes to that requirement. But anyway, this young man fell in love with his daughter and he, he went to Jonathan Edwards and he asked Jonathan Edwards if he could marry his daughter. And I'll just pause and add this little tidbit too. All the young men that are here today, all the middle-aged men, or even all the older single men, if you want to ask somebody to be married, I believe that you need to go to their father and ask for their hand in marriage. Mm -hmm. I believe if you want to take my girls out on a date, you need to come to ask old dad if you can take them out. Now, I've been called bluff on that twice already in my life because um, I didn't think these young men today would be brave enough to do that. But they are. You better be prepared. I was sitting at a basketball game one day, and this kid kept hanging around. I was like, well, I like this kid, but I don't know why he keeps hanging around me. Well, before, before it was over, he, he got up enough courage, and he's like, Mr. Parlett, could I, 
could I take your daughter out or could I date your daughter? I was like, seriously? <laughs> and then here back, uh, just at the fair, uh, me and Ella was working in the food booth, the 4-H food booth, serving cheeseburgers and fries and just trying to be good servants for the 4-H. And this young guy walks up to the window, and I thought he wanted a milkshake or, a, or some french fries. And he said the same thing, could I date your daughter? And I said, son, this is not the time to be asking you those questions. Don't get on out of here. But anyway, what I'm saying is I believe, yeah, you might call me old-fashioned, but I still believe that to be true today, just the way it was here. It's not just a biblical text, not just something I believe that a man should be brave enough and respectful enough to ask for a daughter's hand in marriage or a daughter's hand in dating. But anyway, that didn't cost you a penny. You can just let it go on out here. Don't believe it. But anyway, he asked Jonathan Edwards if he could marry his daughter. And his answer was no. He said, you cannot marry my daughter. And then he said, well, but I love her. And he said, the answer is still no. And then he answered, he called back, he said, well, she loves me too. And Jonathan Edwards said, I'm sorry, the answer is still no. And he said, son, he said, I have nothing against you. And he said, well, why can't I marry your daughter? Why can't I marry her? Her name was Emily. He said, why can't I marry her? Why can't I take her as my bride? And Jonathan Edwards looked at him and he said, because I think you're a decent sort of man. He said, and I'm and going to be good to her. And then this guy's still even more confused. He's like, well, why can't I, if you think I'm a decent person, you think I'm going to be good to her, why can't you have her? Why can't I have her? He said, because she's got a wicked temper. He said that, that uh, you wouldn't be happy with her. He said, you see, she, young man, he said, that uh, you seem to be a good Christian man. And he said, I can't be honest with you. She's got a wicked temper. It's keeping them from that. You say, well, what is the illustration you're trying to, to give for me today? I believe that if we have that wicked temper, Jonathan Edwards loved his daughter, he was, but he was uh, faithful enough to God to know that there was going to be problems in that relationship if his daughter's temper didn't get under control. And today I know that uh, in order for me to be effective for God, to love people the way I'm supposed to be, that if I have that temper, that I'm not going to be effective for God. So what I'm saying is this. Remember those words. Be slow to speak, uh, swift to hear, and slow to anger. It will be a contender for God if we do those things. And then the next verse, in verse number 21, he tells us this. He says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Now today, boy, those are a lot of big words to say this. How many of you have turned the news on this past week? Now, it was, it was homecoming celebration here a couple weeks ago for Page County High School, and just last night for Lou Ray, and I see some of the teenagers here yawning this morning. I got a mom and dad drove me to church, but I was out at home coming late last night, and I got to go listen to Pastor Josh preach, and I'd rather be laying in the bed. But anyway, how many of you seen on the TV, the news, what happened down in Kentucky? It was a county called Hazard, Kentucky. You probably related to uh, the Dukes of Hazard. I don't think that. I think that was in Georgia. But anyway, this place in Hazard, Kentucky had homecoming. And some of these things I shouldn't even mention from behind this pulpit, but they had a male beauty patch. Now, it sounds all innocent. I'm not a big fan of male beauty patches because I don't want to dress up in women's clothes. I would encourage you here today, if you're a man, if you don't, don't want to dress up in women's clothes. Come on, come on, boys. We, we can do better. We can raise money better ways than that. But these people took it a little bit too far. Not only did they that, but the, the teachers and the administrators of this school allow these kids to have this male beauty page and turn into a, to a, a thing of filthiness. They were doing, uh, I shouldn't even say this, I'll probably get in trouble, some of you will probably call me out after this service, doing lap dances with uh, these young men, with these teachers. And then the administrator of the school, the principal, and I'm thankful I'm not comparing it to anybody today in our school system, he took this great big paddle and he paddled these boys being using the in, innuendo of filthiness. Now, I believe it would be good if we brought the big old paddle back to the school, but not to use it in that way. But you say, well, Pastor, what are you saying here? Listen, these people, they, they come out and say, well, it was all done in innocent fun. That's not innocent fun. That's what here James is referring to as filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness. He said it's ridiculous. He goes on. He tells us that. He says this, that we need to receive the word of God. You know, I preached about that last week, get the kids to Jesus, get the adults to Jesus. We need the Word of God now more than we've ever needed, I believe. Amen. Somebody said, could, could things get any worse? How many times have you said that and then you flipped on the news or looked at Facebook or looked at the TV and said, oh, yeah, absolutely, they sure can. There's proof of it. 
There's proof of it. Just that, that story there, I could go on and tell you other stories that I've, that I've looked at that I've seen of just filthy, nasty stuff that we thought would never, ever even uh, come into our, to our schools and are there. But it's because that we've rejected the Word of God. We tried to, we've got God out of all those places. We wanted Him out of the schools. We want Him out of the courthouses. And I believe now we, we families have got Him out of our homes. We don't need Him in our homes right now. We, it, it cramps our style. Well, I can tell you what James is telling you here is that we need God. We need Him more than ever. And he says that we need to receive His Word and we need to receive it as the engrafted Word. I'll give you another fancy illustration here today. Many of you here today, if you're older, you may have dentures. And I'm not asking for a raise of hand if anybody wants to share that they've got dentures this morning. Uh, my, my dad, God rest his soul, had dentures. And uh, for whatever reason, he thought it was the funniest thing ever for if a little kid was around that he would pull those, those things out and try to show them to a kid. I never quite understood that. But anyway, but uh, we've come a long way. Now, instead of the dentist won't encourage you to get dentures, but they encourage you to get dental implants. Why? Because you can't take them out and mess with a kid. You can't do that. And Brother Mike say, yeah, money as well. But because it's, it's part of you. It's, it's part of you. It's implanted into you. You can't take it out. You can't lose them. Uh, somebody would say, well, what's one of the worst things you've lost? Well, I've lost my dentures. I can't eat. See, my former pastor and I, I love him. And he's, every time I go to the uh, pulpit to preach, he's on my mind. And one of the funniest stories he ever told was he was young in his ministry, and he was trying to witness to somebody, just like I told you earlier, be you know, swift to hear and slow to speak. And he was trying to witness to a lady, and she didn't like what he was saying. She got mad and was cursing and carrying on with him. And he said he got so mad that her false teeth flew out of her mouth. And he said it must happen before because she had caught him in mid-air and shoved him back in her mouth. And he said he realized then that, he's, that it was over. He needed to be uh, slow to speak and slow to wrap. He decided that, that that visit was over. He needed to move on. But what I'm saying here is those dental implants that you might have, some of you might have them, I don't know, but they're part of you. They're engrafted in you. They're implanted in you. That's what he's telling us that we need to have the Word of God. Not just to be a hearer of it on Sunday morning, not just to be a hearer of it on Wednesdays, but we need to have it engrafted into our hearts and to our lives. It needs to be implanted in us. It needs to be a part of us. Amen. And it's there. That's why that verse says that if we hide it in our heart, if we implant it in our heart, if we engraft it in our heart, it's there that we might not sin against God. Amen. When we go to a situation where we're tempted and we don't give in on the temptation, it's because the Word of God is engrafted in our heart. It's implanted in us. It's a part of us. And if we're going to be a contender for God, we need to have the Word of God engrafted in our heart. We need to get rid of all that filthiness, all that naughtiness that the Word of God tells us about. We need to get rid of those things. But I can tell you, if the Word of God is implanted in you, it says there, it's able to save your souls. It's able to save your souls. If you have it implanted in your heart and in mind, you won't have to worry about all those other things that we need to get rid of because you won't want to participate in them and you won't want to do them. Amen. The next thing is this. I'll move on quickly today. Verse 22, it says, Be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And I thought about that, how James refers to that, and how he uses it over and over again, and how important it is for us to that our actions speak louder than our words. And I had a Sunday school teacher when I was a young man who often told us that we might be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. You might have heard that same uh, analogy before in your life, and it's true. And all of you know, I said earlier that I'm an independent fundamental Baptist, and I believe in in the fundamental truths of God's Word. And I believe in, uh, in teach and preach from the King James Bible. And you say, well, here goes Pastor Josh again. He's just going to harp on the King James Bible. Well, I'm going to give you a shocker this morning. There's another version that I prefer over the King James Version. Anybody have a guess what it is? Mike's looking at me like, oh my goodness, where's Pastor going? I'll have a lot of complaints today. The version is this. you probably never heard of it, but it's the doer's version. It's the version that James is talking about. He said, be you doers of the word. I can go through my good old King James Bible and I can give you many, many reasons why I want to carry it, why I want to teach from it. Because it doesn't remove certain passages of scripture where it's important about how we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. What does it take for us to be born again? What does it take for us to be saved? And some of the liberal translations of the Bible, those things have been moved. They've been removed. You say, well, I can't understand the King James Bible that you preach from. Well, I can tell you, there's one that you can't understand, and that is God's Word. Continue on. James, the same one that wrote this book under God's inspiration, said, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask, and God will provide it. If you don't understand it, read it again. Right. 
If you don't understand it, then read it again. It'll get engrafted into your heart. It'll get implanted into your soul and into your mind. But then once we've done that, that better version that I told you on, that doer's version, will make more of an influence than any other version out there. It'll make more of an influence than my King James Version. I can stand here on Sunday mornings and preach my heart out from it. And I plan to continue to do that until the Lord calls me away from here. But listen, and I meant when he calls me away from here, I mean he calls me to heaven, not away from the church. I'll just get that cleared up. But listen, I, I intend to do that, but there's a better version out there. It's a doer's version. That we take that word. And when I leave here, if I would be your pastor and I would leave here and I could take this word and close it up and open it back up next Sunday morning, I wouldn't be a very much of a contender for Christ. But not only me, you wouldn't be either. If you'd leave here and close this word and say, well, Pastor had a good message this morning. The Lord really spoke to his heart and used him. And then you try to try to feed off that all week long, and I encourage you to do that, but there's more to it. You need to take that and use, use that doer's version. Be that doer of the word. Amen. Be the one that goes out. Brother Dick Brim, that was faithful here for so many years, said that we can't just talk the talk. we got to walk the walk. Amen. And I believe that walk is a high calling from God. And I believe that today, yeah, if you don't agree with me about my King James Version, that's fine. But we cannot disagree on one thing, that there's a better version. That's the doer's version. And I would encourage you to go out, open up your doer's version of your Bible, and live it. Live out the Word of God in your daily life. And then he goes on in the rest of these verses. He talks more about how important it is for us to be a doer of his word. And these relate to me very simple. I love how God uses these men to give us simple illustrations. He says, for if any be a hearer in the word of the word, in verse 23, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. He said, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Basically what James is telling us here too, and I mentioned that this morning in Sunday school, there's two people that knows your heart. It's not me, it's not your wife, it's not your kids, it's not your dog. All these people are good judges of, of a person's heart, but it's the good Lord above and yourself. Right. That's who knows your heart. And that's what James is telling us here. A person who goes and looks in the mirror and turns straight away. I look in the mirror in the morning and think, my goodness, boy, I get older and uglier every day. And I can't forget how ugly my mug is. If I would, if I would forget that and think that I'm going to look in the mirror this morning... And then I'm going to head out here to Walmart and buy me some hairspray and something to get my hair looking pretty good. That, you say, well, that's silly, Pastor. That's exactly what James is saying here. Wait a minute. I don't have hair. I don't need uh, anything to, to, for my hair. But that's what James is saying. He said it's just that simple. He said that's how you're going to approach your life. Things that should come so simple to you, things that should be easy for you, they're going to be hard for you. Because the Bible tells us, too, it says that the way of the transgressor is hard. The way of sin is hard. And if we are just hearers of the word, not doers of the word. We're going to look in that mirror. We're going to forget what we've seen. We're going to forget what we've heard. And we're going to head on out and do the things that we shouldn't do. Whereas if we're a doer of that word, if we're applying it and grafting it in our heart and mind, we'll remember what we'll look like. We'll remember how ugly we looked when we looked in that mirror. Or we'll look like, yeah, I look out here at this beautiful crowd of people that I have that the Lord's blessed this congregation with. I don't know how I can give you such a... Uh, old, ugly-looking pastor. But anyway, we would be, uh, that's how we would be if we turned away and we forgot exactly what we looked about. And then the last thing I want to cover is in verse number 25. And he says this, when we talked about looking in that mirror, he goes on and James says, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. Listen, he said we've got to continue in to the perfect law of liberty. James is not talking about the Mosaic Law. He's not talking about the Old Testament Law. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the Law of Grace. The Law of Grace is simple this, that God loved us enough that He sent His Son to die for us. That's grace. It's something that we, it's a, it's a path that's been given to us that we did not deserve. That's what grace is. And James says that if we look onto that perfect Law of Liberty and not just look at it, but he says that if we continue therein, and I know that today it's a struggle. I know that there's many challenges that face each and every one of us. I know as a parent raising kids, there's challenges that face us. I know in just life in general, there's challenges that face us. But I believe that James is encouraging us here under God's inspiration that if we continue therein, and be, he says, be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. He's telling us that we'll be blessed. He's telling us what the results will be. He told us down here, if we 
and have that engrafted word in our heart, it's enough to save our souls. And then he also told us here, if we live in that perfect law of liberty, you know, I'm thankful that I don't have to get out of bed and know that I've got to keep every law that's in God's word because I know that I'm not able to do it. I want to do it. I want to do the best that I can do for God. But I know that the Bible says we've all sinned and we've all come short of his glory. And I know that that includes myself as well. I'm no different than you. But I'm thankful that that law of liberty covers that sin. I'm thankful that it gives me uh, forgiveness of that sin. Now, they said again, you, do you have a, a, a license to sin? No, we do not have a license to sin. We get out on the freeway. Let me give you this one last illustration. We get on the interstate. And if you're like me, I don't mind driving on the interstate. But Rachel's got interstate anxiety. And a lot of times we take other roads. But uh, during the day, my travels back and forth to, to work, we'll jump on the interstate to get to point A to point B in the quickest manner possible. Or we'll be traveling on vacation and we'll, we'll take the interstate or what some people call them the freeway. I guess I don't know what the difference is. Out in California, they call them freeways. Uh, probably because they got a lot more lanes than, than we have. We need, to, we need a few more extra lanes. But that's a different, different subject. But anyway, they call them a freeway. But it's really not free. Well, you say, well, how? Because you've got to follow the rules. You can't go out here on the freeway when the sign says 70 and drive 90, even though there's people blowing by you that probably are. But if you want to continue driving on that freeway, you've got you to gotta obey the rules. And that's what he's telling us here. We can't obey these Old Testament rules. Let me give you a couple of them. It says here, uh, in my Bible, it says, you shall not make idols. Not any of us today are going to go out here and, and uh, crack up a statue and bow down to worship it. If you are, I'll certainly be praying for you. But we're not doing those type of things. We're remembering the Sabbath day. We're, we're keeping the Sabbath day holy. Our Sabbath day uh, is not Saturday. Our Sabbath day is on Sunday. That's when we worship the Lord. That's when he rose from the grave. And then it says, honor your father and mother. Those are simple truths that we can go on. They get a little bit difficult. They go on and say, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. And you shall not steal. We say, well, Pastor, that's simple. Those are easy things. Well, they are for, for some, but they're not for, for others. But I'm thankful today that Two, because the Word of God says that if we've broken one of these commandments, we've broken them all. Just because uh, I've got to tell a little white lie to get out of a situation, it's no different in God's eyes than any of these ten commandments that He's given us. And I'm thankful today that I'm not under this Mosaic law. I'm not thankful. I'm thankful that I don't have to come and give sacrifices to try to be forgiven when I do break Amen. one of these. I'm thankful that our sacrifices come. Amen. Our sacrifice has already been paid for. It's been given. That's why that we can have this perfect law of liberty. It gives us that, that we can have this law of grace. Today, he goes on, he finishes out in verse 26 and 27. He says, If any man among you seem to be religious, religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. What I'm telling you here is he's saying we can come to church on Sunday mornings. We can come to church on Wednesday nights. But if we're not serious about God's word, our religion is in vain. We can be religious about many things. I don't like that term, religious. I've said it before, we can be religious about going to play golf. If getting ready to be hunting season. I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but you can be religious about hunting. People say, oh, I can, I can worship God up in my tree stand. Yeah, you can. You can. I'm not going to argue with that, but I think he'd rather have you sitting in this tree stand and this bench right here this morning worshiping him. And, uh, you know, I don't even want to get into that hunting law on Sunday anymore. I'm not a fan of it. Some of my friends are. But anyway, uh, what I'm telling you is that we can get religious about many things. But he says here, he tells us, if this man cannot bridle up his tongue, if he cannot control his tongue, if he goes back to them first verses, if he's not swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, it says his religion is in vain. But he goes on, he tells us what pure religion is. He says it's undefiled before God and the Father. This is what pure religion is. It's simple. It says to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and listen and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So I'll close with the same question I asked you to start with this morning. What have you done for God? What have you done for his church? Have you visited any of the fatherless? Have you visited and helped any of the widows? Seems like simple illustrations, but many times we get caught up in those things. Hey, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. It's what God tells us here that we need to do. And then he says that we will keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And I'm thankful today that uh, uh, all of us know that we're not going to be able to keep ourselves completely unspotted from the world. I told you earlier when I started this, this, this quote that I used this morning to title my message, Are You a Contender or a Pretender? Come from a joke between me and a friend. 
And uh, you know my kids, I told you, we, they show livestock. Well, they show uh, different animals, and they wash them up, they groom them, they clip them, they get them ready, they want them to look their best. Some of you here have got kids and grandkids that do the same thing. And uh, my kids sh show pigs. Somebody, did everybody see that show on TV, Pig Royalty? It, it was a very bad show. You shouldn't watch it if you did. Shame on you. Just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, people told us and jokes and all oh, that. Y'all should have been on that show, Pig Royalty. I don't know if I should be offended to that, but I go back to these verses. Well, I'm going to be slow to anger. I don't want to get mad about it. What I'm telling you is this. The kids, and I'll close, I promise I'll close. The kids can put all their best effort into that animal. And I'm going to use that pig for an example. They can clean him up. They can wash him. They can shine him. They can put oil on him. But if they don't stay working with him, keep him moving, he's going to lay down in the mud. He's going to roll in the dirt. He's going to get spotted. And that's the what James is telling us here. If we don't be doers of God's word, if we're not continuing to work for him, do the things that he is, then we'll get spotted from the world. It's easy for us to not be spotted from the world. How? Getting, let God's word be engrafted in your heart. Be a contender for God. Be slow to speak and slow to get angry. But be swift to hear. Be swift to hear his word. And then let these words sink into you that he said over and over again. They're worthy to be repeated. Be a doer of his word and not just a hearer. Let's go to the Lord today in prayer together. Susie, would you come to the piano?